Selamat siang. Wedi. Selamat siang, Bu Sari. Oh, selamat siang, Pak Budi. Wah, ini saya gantian yang bodinya enggak not delicious, Bu Eti. Oh, gitu, Bu Sari. Oh, kenapa, Bu? Kecapean atau enggak enak badan? Kecapean, masuk angin. Kayaknya saya juga ya, tapi agak tadi tadi kan kuliah pagi tuh, Bu, sama Bu Maria. Pagi tadi udah dapat ini. Pagi-pagi udah mual-mual muntah-muntah dua kali gitu, sampai agak lemes, tapi puji Tuhan masih bisa ikut sesi apa kuliah pagi tadi gitu pas kuliah itu biasanya kalau pas kuliah udah nggak sadar bu semangat kan bu abis kuliah baru kerasa lagi <laughs> tapi ini puji tuhan kami udah di kampus bu Sari Pak Budi saya oh, ya. Maria yeah. dari ruang akreditasi ini ya yeah, tadi saya pengen ke kampus tapi terus nggak yeah. kuat saya terus ya udah dari rumah aja yes ya yeah, bu Mar- <laughs> Pak Budi dari rumah dari kampus Pak Budi saya tadi di kampus bu hanya Saya kuliah jam 10 dari kampus tuh malah sinyalnya agak kesulitan saya dari ruang di kanat itu. Oh. Lalu saya anu, ya. Agak kurang lancar ya. Iya, lalu saya pulang nah. agak. Jadi, tadi saya ke kampus jam kuliah jam 10. Oke. Okay. Kalau kemarin waktu acara malam apresiasi itu kok sempat berhenti lama itu kan apa ya? Pak Enggi. Halo, Bu. Halo, wah ini di ruang RRU ini. <laughs> Jadi <laughs> ini ya anu nih calon rektor ini. <laughs> Fotonya beda, bukan foto-foto dekan tapi rektor. Nah, Nanti ini dulu langsung dulu. langsung rektor ini. Fotonya <laughs> tidak di sini. Bon. Mas Kevin Teja Kusuma hadir. Hadir Pak Halo. Oh iya. Uh. Kevin ini rajin no? Iya. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Prof Priscila. Hello everyone, good afternoon. <laughs> Hello, Hello everyone, good afternoon, Prof Priscila. Wonderful day. <laughs> Where are you now, Priscila? Where are you, Priscila? Uh, I'm in. I'm at home. <laughs> okay. I thought you are uh, still commuting somewhere, some places. No, no, I'm still, I'm home. Is that a ah, virtual okay. background or is these real plans behind you? <laughs> I'm adjusting to the theme hmm. that you will speak. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hello, Prof. Priscilla. Hello. Please share your material presentation. This uh, room chat. No? You have a PowerPoint? That yes. You... Okay. Yeah. Can you attach to the chat uh, column? Uh, yes. I was planning on sharing my screen. That way, I can move the uh-huh. slide myself. Okay. Would you like Please to do work. that? Or... Yeah, yeah. Attention. You do it. You do it. But uh, at the same time, you uh, attach the document. In... So the student will uh, by themselves download uh, the document. Ah. Okay. Okay. Let me see if uh, uh, I turn it into a PDF then for them or yes, any any format I think uh, will do. It's quite heavy, huh? Thank you. Thanks, Priscilla. Okay, Priyati. After uh, for what? Yeah. Is now open camera? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Priyati. Yes. Yes, sir. Hello, Pak Indro. Thank you. I also invite Bu Penny from uh, Agriculture Faculty of Gajah Mada. Okay, okay. Bu Yeti, please uh, announce uh, invitation uh, from Agriculture uh, Faculty Gajah Mada, Bu Yeti. All right. Halo Pak Hendri. Ya Bu. Ya, di mana ini? Ya di rumah. Tapi oh, rumah. Bu agak sakit Bu ya. Cerik. Iya. Oh, agak wah. masuk angin saya. Oh. Oh, delicious ini. Tadi <laughs> oh, <laughs> delicious. Tadi sangat delicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So who is attending today? Because you're mentioning lawyers, but I'm, I'm hearing agriculture faculty. Yeah, the, the, the topics, uh, topics uh, draw some attention. So they want to know because mm. putting gender and food sovereignty possibly not so familiar in the subject. <laughs> yeah. Mungkin kita bisa mulai supaya ada kesempatan tanya jawab nanti. Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the virtual lecture series Talef. I am Eti Indrawati or Miss Eti and I will guide you through this event. Before the virtual lecture is started officially, let me greet the attendees first. Okay. To all attendees of this virtual lecture, how are you today? Fine. Okay. <laughs> it's very delicious. <laughs> very delicious. <laughs> I hope that you are in good health and condition. Yeah. Um, may God bless uh, Busari, Ma'am Sari Murti, that you will get better soon, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for participating in this virtual lecture in this fine Tuesday afternoon. Now allow me to welcome our honorable distinguished guests. The honorable, the Dean of Law Faculty of Universitas Atmaja Yogyakarta, Dr. Y. Sarimurti Widyastuti SH Mpung. The honorable, the Vice Dean One of Law Faculty of Universitas Atmaja Yogyakarta, Dr. Triana Johannes SH Mpung. The honorable, the vice dean too of law faculty of Universitas Atmaja Yogyakarta, Mr. N. Budi Aryanto Wijaya, S. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you. The honorable, the vice dean three of law faculty of Universitas Atmaja Yogyakarta, Mr. B. Hengki Widiantoro, S. Hi. Hello, everyone. Okay, thank you so much. I would also like to welcome the speaker of this spirit uh, of this virtual lecture, the honorable speaker, Professor. Priscilla Clays, Senior Research Fellow and Associate Professor in Food Sovereignty, Human Rights and Resilience at the Center of Agri Agroecology, Water and Resilience, CAWR, Coventry University. Praise be to God for having you in this virtual lecture, uh, Professor Priscilla. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. Okay, welcome, uh, Professor Priscilla. All right. And the Honorable Moderator, Ma'am Maria Hutapea SHM Pum, and the Honorable Lecturers and our beloved students of Law Faculty of Universitas Atmajaya Yogyakarta, and all of the participants, nice to meet you virtually here. To start off, let us all take time in silence to pray together. Let's pray. Amen. Okay, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, now let us sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, that will be led by Kita Widya Law Choir. To the host, please.
right. Thank you so much. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to listen to the opening remarks delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Law, Universitas Atmajaya, Yogyakarta. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ye Sarimurti Widyastuti SHM Hum. To the Honorable Dr. Ye Sarimurti Widyastuti SHM Hum, please. Thank you, Ibu Eti, as a Master of Ceremony today. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone, and also good morning, Prof. Patricia, because I think in UK now is morning, yeah. Our guest of honor, honorable from Professor Priscilla Cleese, Vice Dean, member of faculty, and of course, the student I love. Welcome to School of Atmajaya, Yogyakarta. Now, please welcome to virtual lecture series at the special occasion of Dies Natalis 2021 of the University of Atmaja Yogyakarta. I welcome the topic you are to share us, gender equality and food sovereignty. There are some reasons why this topic is important, both for jurisprudential studies and for everyday life. Our university is located in the heart of beautiful land. Yogyakarta has a philosophy that emphasizes respect for human dignity. The philosophy of Yogyakarta is Hamamayu Hayuning Bawono. This is the philosophy that guides humans to always foster harmony between human and nature, so that the world will foster the beauty and sustainability of human. Ladies and gentlemen, both the king and queen of Kraton, Mayodok Artohat in Ingrat, were very committed to respecting and promoting women's rights. The court of Yogyakarta is very active in the issue of equality of Indonesia in public life. The king and queen have five descendants, all daughters. They live the value of equality of women and men in life. The queen, named Iburatu Hemas, is very active in promoting gender equality in Yogyakarta. She has active in promoting gender mainstreaming and development since 2000. And her position as a member of the regional representative council of the Republic of Indonesia. She is also active in leading political women's caucus. Her work in the council is of influence towards gender just public policies, including in food sovereignty. The topic today, gender equality is food sovereignty, is very close to the actualization of the vision of Amamayu Hayuning Bawono and also Pameo Tutu sana tutu kadang yang mati melukina kelangan. It means even though they are not relatives and family, if they die, they lost nonetheless. Hopefully, today lecture material will enrich all of us, especially those who are interested in studying in more depth how gender equality, awareness of the gender perspective in realizing food sovereignty is an important requirement for maintaining and improving the quality of life. Food system can be only just and fair if gender equality is developed progressively. 
after this activity, I hope there will be a follow-up follow in the form of joint research, exchange of lecturers and students framed in an MOU between UAJ and Coventry University. Well, of course, we cannot wait to listen to the lecture from Prof. Priscilla. Enjoy the lecture. The lecture. Thank you to the audience, friends, and staff who are prepared and attended this virtual session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, the Honorable Dr. Yesari Murti Vidyastuti for the opening remarks. Okay, right now we are now going to listen to the foreword delivered by Mr. Henry Thomas Simarmata. To the Honorable Mr. Henry, please. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to introduce the subject that we uh, will listen to Professor Professor Kleis, uh, Ibu Sari, Dean, uh, the Deanship, a member of faculty, their students, and uh, juries, lawyers, academia who happen to, uh, be, uh, to participate in this uh, forum. The first of the subject that we uh, want to know from a presentation from Professor Kleis is the subject of food sovereignty. We are aware that. In many countries, they differentiate between food security and food sovereignty. So uh, most, possi most possible way to uh, relate with the subject is to understand uh, the difference uh, between the two concepts and how it applies in a uh, food system uh, in any given country. Second subject, of course, gender equality, which I'm fully aware because I'm men, so uh, I will leave it to all uh, women uh, lecturer here to speak for themselves. So I just want to uh, put emphasis that the relation between uh, gender equality and food sovereignty is also uh, becoming more and more uh, important studies, jurisprudential uh, uh, observations and applications in a food system uh, in any given country. So on both topics, I, I do encourage uh, the, this forum, uh, especially students, to speak, to ex uh, uh, do exchange to Professor Clays and throw your ideas, or anything you want to know, anything you want to argue with Professor, uh, it will be really better for learning into the concept and uh, uh, understand how it applies in everyday life. I thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Henry, for the foreword. Now the host, will, uh, the host will help us to take the picture of the team, the speaker, Mr. Henry, and uh, the moderator. Please. Okay. Okay. Finish, Miss Eti. Still, Miss Eti, your voice is not here. Still mute. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much, Mr. Vincent, for your help. Ladies and gentlemen, gender equality in food sovereignty has been chosen as the theme of today's virtual lecture. Uh, well, in the pandemic situation, I remember a verse, verily, with every difficulty, there is relief. We might face not that easy life unlike the pre-pandemic, but there is still an advantage that we can take just like having unlimited access to learn from the expert and kind people, sharing knowledge, through online seminar or course or virtual lecture. This virtual lecture will be led by Mem Maria Hutapea SHM Hum as moderator. As we know that Mem Maria is one of a lecturer in Faculty of Law, Universitas Atmajaya, Yogyakarta. 
as a lecturer of agrarian law. To the Honorable Memaria, please. Wait for a second. Thank you, very much to uh, thank you very much to God and everybody here, and especially for Professor Priscilla. Uh, I don't know whether uh, this is your first time talking to the audience uh, in Yogyakarta. Uh, I hope so. But for me, uh, personally, that this is a very important lesson because uh, we could learn a lot from you about two things. First one is about the gender equality and the second one is about the food uh, sovereignty. Uh, well, for us Indonesia, I think uh, these two things would be very expensive and very important, especially talking about uh, uh, gender equality. So everybody, uh, we are going to listen to our Professor uh, Priscilla and we will, uh, Professor, you will have uh, time to uh, deliver your uh, material and also we will have also time uh, for questions and answers. So we have two hours and then I will give you two time up to you, whether you're going to use a one hour or one and a half, but we still have time for you to learn about uh, gender equality. Or maybe is it about the experience in your country, in UK? What do you think, Professor Priscilla? Maybe you could give us a little bit uh, key for this. Uh, is this about experience in the UK or also in other countries? I'm so sorry, ma'am. Ah, okay, still, still mute. Was mute. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not focusing on UK perspective, no. Okay. So it's in general, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> let's listen to Professor Priscilla and time is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes yeah, very good. Okay. So hello everyone, and thank yeah. you so much for joining us today. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to have this opportunity to share some of these topics I feel very passionate about. And I wanna start by thanking uh, Henry Professor Henry, as well as everyone here who organized um, this event and helped me um, yeah, with, with facilitating this participation. Um, I wanna encourage everyone to put themselves on mute if possible, uh, and then we can maybe reconnect when we um, uh, have some discussion afterwards. Yes, does that work? Okay, fantastic. So I will share my screen uh, and if somebody can confirm if they can see my PowerPoint, that would be great. Can you see it okay? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, so this courses on the future of food are everywhere. Last week, the UN held its food system summit the objective of this summit was, and I quote here, to transform the way the world produces, consumes, and thinks about food. The summit claimed that it would deliver game-changing solutions to promote healthier and more sustainable food systems. Yet many questions have been raised about this summit. Why do private foundations have so much influence? Why are human rights not central to the debates? Are the proposed solutions truly transformative? Or do they actually promote industrial agriculture and big data? 
and who is really participating in the dialogues leading to this summit. We won't have time today to dig into the summit outcomes and what this may mean for the future of global food systems governance. But I would like to unpack two issues that I think are at the heart of food systems governance and that help explain also why the summit has been so contested. And these two questions are, do human rights matter for the future of food? And do women matter for the future of food? And I will divide my talk into these two sections. So one looking at human rights and one looking at gender because I didn't start working on gender right away. And I really wanted to share like how uh, my interest for women's rights and gender developed through a food sovereignty lens. So at the heart of, uh, at the beginning of each of these two sections, I'll ask all of you to uh, kind of stop and reflect a little bit and share some of your ideas in the chat. That way we can make this session um, a little bit interactive. Right, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the chat, so I'll just two times ask you to reflect a little bit, and then when I say go, you can all press your um, enter button and uh, share your responses in the chat. Right. So, uh, so we'll we'll do that now as we start, just uh, so we can test if it works. So I'll just ask you if I say food and human rights, what comes to your mind? Right, just food and human rights. So if in this chat column, yes, yeah, as, as, uh, as Heron show, is showing here. So in this chat column, so if you can just type some ideas. When I say food or food sovereignty and human rights, what comes to your mind, right? Or why are human rights important for the future of food? So I'll just leave you one minute. And then when I say go, I'll ask everyone to uh, post their answers. Right, so you should all be typing right now. Bapak-bapak uh, dan ibu-ibu, ini uh, Prof. Kriskila uh, menawarkan berkaitan dengan human rights atau uh, human rights. Apa ada kata-kata yang muncul berkaitan dengan dua topik tersebut, ya berkaitan dengan makanan dan human rights. Yes, we have this, uh, Professor. Like me. Okay. I see some. Re okay, so go. You can post your answers now. I already see land grabbing and livelihood. This is great. So more responses. When I say human rights, food, what images, what thoughts come to your mind? Access to land. Yes. Don't be shy, everyone. I see there is more than 70 people here. So we should get more responses. For my subject, of course, uh, about agrarian reform, you think so? Yes, perfect, absolutely. I think uh, agrarian reform is a key, key topic, uh, crossing human rights and food, sustainability, yes. Food system. I wanna leave you a bit more time so you can, you can share some more responses. Involving women, absolutely. Can we go also to social peace? Is that possible about social peace? Yeah. Social, I'm not hearing you well. Yeah, social peace regarding uh, that the organizing food trade, something like that. Is it mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. All, all, there is no good or bad answer, right? It's just to see what comes to you. Power relation, yeah, that's a very good one. We'll see. I see it's the same people posting. So if more people can be encouraged to, to share their ideas as well, future life. Life from Kurniawati. To promote gender equality and empower women, right? Wonderful. Okay, so you can continue maybe posting and reflecting, but I'll just share my, my own perspective, right? Fantastic. Oh. I'm trying to share my screen, but something else is showing up. Can somebody stop sharing? Okay.
Okay, can you see it again? Okay, great. Yes. Okay, so in my view, human rights are a key resistance tool. So framing claims in human rights terms is more and more popular with social movements around the globe for a number of reasons. Human rights are universal, they create unity, and they provide a frame for diverse groups to get together. Human rights bring legitimacy, they bring attention to a cause, and they come with monitoring and reporting mechanisms. So they provide a channel through which you can process demands. Even though in many cases, human rights are also bureaucratic, not easy to access, and not always effective. Over the last 15 years, I have done research and developed collaborations with La Via Campesina at different levels. As some of you may know, La Via Campesina is a transnational agrarian movement. So what does this mean? Transnational means it is organized across over 70 countries. So it's not limited to one country. Agrarian means it brings together people of the land. So peasants, but also agriculture workers and indigenous peoples. And it is a social movement because it engages in protests, mobilization, but also advocacy and policy dialogue. At the same time, it is involved in promoting sustainable farming practices and building local food systems. On this map, you can see the presence of La Via Campesina across these 70 countries and all their farmers organizations that are part of this network. And during my PhD, so this was between 2008 and 2013, I conducted field work in 13 different countries. And I did this while working for the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, Olivia Duskutter, some of you may know him. I also spent quite a lot of time in UN arenas. So the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN Committee on World Food Security. And in all these arenas, peasant organizations like, of like Via Campesina had managed to get their voices heard and influence discussions. What I found fascinating is how La Via Campesina was a diverse movement. So it was bringing together a huge network of people with different ideologies, different religions, different languages, different cultures, but it had managed to articulate shared demands. And it had done that by using human rights. And this really triggered my interest. I was familiar with human rights even before starting my PhD. And this is a very old picture when I joined FIAN International, so the main international organization working on the right to food in 2003. In the following years, I participated in what we call fact-finding missions in different countries like Brazil or the Philippines. So fact-finding missions bring together a team of international lawyers and activists who document violations of the right to food to call international attention. And through FIAN, I discovered that many rural communities were being evicted from the land, either by the state or by private actors. Often these communities had nowhere to go, no compensation and no recourse mechanism. I want to highlight here that I found and still find the right to food very convincing. The right to food is recognized in the UN Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, and it is also recognized in the International Covenant for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It basically means that nobody should go hungry and that everyone is entitled enough food to live a dignified life. And thanks to a right to food campaign in India, as you can see on this picture, massive school feeding programs have now been deployed so that children can have at least one free meal every day. And this has actually meant that uh, a lot more parents are sending their kids to school. Hunger is not caused by extreme water, weather events or calamities. 
It is caused by social injustice. And this is why the right to food is a very powerful tool to analyze food systems and identify the structural issues that are causing hunger and food insecurity. Yet I came to realize, talking to food sovereignty activists, that their ambition went beyond the right to food, even though peasants are the most affected by hunger. As I document in my book that uh, came out of my PhD research called Human Rights and the Food Sovereignty Movement, the agenda of food sovereignty activists went beyond the right to food. It was really to reinvent human rights from below. And this is how I started following the emergence of the rights of peasants. I might as well tell you right away that this is an amazing success story, one that ha doesn't happen often in the UN system. After 17 years of struggle, peasants succeeded in getting the UN General Assembly to adopt a new international legal instrument called the UNDRAP, UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. And this instrument was adopted in 2018, so really recently. And it was negotiated on the basis of a draft developed by La Via Campesina itself. And this is actually how I met Henry. For five years, I interviewed the peasants active in the negotiation process at the UN, but I also actively followed the sessions of the Intergovernmental Working Group in charge of elaborating this instrument. I spent a lot of time in this dark room full of diplomats, mostly men with a suit and a tie, and also some time at the cafe where people were strategizing over coffee. And before going into this process a bit more, I want to share three reasons why I think the UNDRAP is really important and should be celebrated. The first reason is that the UNDRAP recognizes new human rights to land, seeds, and food sovereignty. This is the first time that these rights are recognized in a UN instrument as standalone human rights. So before, aspects of these rights were recognized as part of the right to food, for example, but they didn't exist as standalone human rights. The second reason is that the UNDRAP recognizes peasants as political and legal subjects. And for me, that's also really important because the declaration gives them visibility. In many countries, the term peasants continue to be pejorative. And in fact, many diplomats and states refused to even talk about peasants in the negotiation process. They felt that peasants don't exist or that peasants should be dismissed. And I argue and feel very strongly that the UNDRAP is promoting a recognition of peasants as modern and active actors who hold knowledge, who hold solutions, and they should be involved in the food system transition. Finally, the UNDRAP is a legitimate instrument because it was elaborated from the bottom up. And with Mark Edelman, we wrote a series of articles uh, on the UNDRAP and developed this idea that the UNDRAP is a case of vernacularization in reverse. This is a bit um, tricky, but I will explain um, in very simple terms what it means. So the famous legal anthropologist, Sally Engel Mary, came up with this concept of vernacularization to analyze the process by which global ideas like human rights get appropriated and translated in local contexts. So for example, ideas around gender equality and women's rights are used in a variety of contexts by different people to advance their own agenda. And in the process, meanings of women's rights evolve, get contested and vary. The key idea here that I want you to understand is that human rights are not static. They are socially constructed by the people who claim them. So that is the concept of vernacularizing. 
there are other people who just joined to mute their mic because it's creating a lot of background noise. Thank you, that's amazing. So what we observed with the UNDROP was a reverse process, right? So La Via Campesina did not translate and adapt the right to food in local context. Really what they sought to do was to create framings of human rights that resonated with their worldviews. They really wanted to be makers of law. And this is a very important aspect to consider. And I really hope you can remember that aspect of my lecture. <clears throat> is that human rights are often seen as the exclusive domain of lawyers and not of the people. But I think that human rights can only be relevant if they are conceptualized by the marginalized, by the oppressed who need them as a resistance tool. So in this important work, <clears throat> Clifford Bob has developed a framework to analyze the creation of new human rights from below. And he has done this looking at the experience of the rights of indigenous peoples, but also of the right to water, which developed recently as a new human right as well. And Clifford Bob identifies four steps. I'm not going to go into detail, but I wanna apply these four steps to the UNDRAP to emphasize some important aspects. So these four steps are framing claims in human rights terms. So this is at the local level then connecting local communities to human rights NGOs or to the global human rights movements. And then you will need to convince some states to support your, your idea. And then when you, once your rights are recognized, uh, comes the implementation stage. So how does this apply to the UNDROP? The first um, <clears throat> the idea here is framing. So framing is a key activity for social movements because movements need to mobilize their members. And as I mentioned earlier, human rights are a very powerful frame because it brings legitimacy and it's a common language for everyone to um, come together around. But as social movements use human rights, they also contribute to the emergence of alternative conceptions of human rights. Historically, <clears throat> Human rights are associated with this. So with the Enlightenment era, the French Revolution, the West, the individual. But today's social movements are pushing for alternative understandings of human rights. One that are more multicultural, less colonial, less Western, and that emphasize collective aspects. And for example, in the UNDROP, the fact that the right to land is recognized as a collective and not only an individual land, in my opinion, is really indicative of this trend. The second uh, aspect of this framework is the externalization. That basically means that local demands need to be scaled up. They need to reach the global level. The declaration was originally drafted and adopted by local peasant organizations in the late 90s in Indonesia. And later it was shared with groups in Southeast Asia before it was discussed internally for another six years uh, by La Via Campesina as a whole. And in the framework developed by Bob, as you can see on this, on this slide, the emphasis is really played, pushed, uh, placed on the need for local actors to connect through some local NGOs or lawyers to big NGOs of the human rights movement like Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. But what I showed in my research is that um, in the last 20 years, we've seen tremendous changes with social movements now recognized as global actors speaking for themselves in these UN arenas. And so they no longer need SGOs to speak on their behalf. Of course, they still may need the support of NGOs. Uh, and in the case of UNDROP, uh, we could also see this was the case. For example, strong alliances were developed with FIAN and SITIM, in part because um, some UN arenas are hard to access. And so you still need NGOs to get in. But I really wanna highlight that um, global movements maintain political control over their positions in these discussions. 
So here is a photo of peasant activists strategizing with their allies. The third step is convincing states. So one of the key um, activities of movements is to try and seize legal and political opportunities, especially at the global level. And here it is clear that the global food crisis of 2007-2008 was key in gathering support for the UNDRAP. But to push for the creation of new human rights in the UN system, you really need the support of a sponsoring state. In the case of La Via Campesina, the movement reached out to Bolivia, which then created a core group with Cuba, Ecuador, and South Africa. Bolivia proved to be an important ally, but when the coup hit in 2019, this also proved challenging because we lost Bolivia as a strong actor pushing for the implementation of the rights of peasants. On this photo, you can see the collective sense of victory by all the actors involved in the UNDRAP process. Diplomats, lawyers, peasant activists, NGOs, researchers, but also UN staff. And I want to emphasize here the importance of trust and collaboration within this group across institutions. And these people had been working together for years to achieve this victory. Three years after the adoption of the UNDROP, the key challenge is of course, step four, the implementation. I won't enter into details here, but I want to point to um, a number of activities that are currently taking place to advance the implementation of the rights contained in the UNDRAP. So first is the development of training and dissemination materials, like you see here on this slide. And it is also important to bring the instrument to the attention of policymakers, as well as to translate it beyond the six UN languages. So I don't know if it's already been translated in uh, Bahasa, I'm, I'm assuming it has been. Um, second is the creation of a monitoring mechanism at UN level. So using the model of the special rapporteur or maybe an expert group to monitor the implementation of UNDROP and document cases of violations of peasants' rights. And finally, is the importance of using the UNDRAP as a baseline in other processes, in other advocacy processes. And this is something that indigenous peoples have been really good at. So with their declaration, they have pushed uh, their agenda in all the spaces they would attend. And I can see in the case of peasants' rights that the instrument could also be used as a baseline in discussions around food security, land governance, seeds, biodiversity, climate change, or trade. Lastly, and as we move into the second part of my talk, I want to mention an additional challenge, and that is pushing for progressive interpretation of the rights contained in the UNDROP. I have insisted on the creation of new human rights, which I see as a victory. But that doesn't mean that the declaration is progressive on all fronts. And as I will show now in the second part of this lecture, when it comes to gender and human rights and women's rights, sorry, the declaration faces a number of limitations that I think are important to highlight and address at the implementation stage. So I'll now stop sharing my screen and ask you to reflect a little bit and uh, again, post some responses in the chat. What do you see as the role of women in relation to the future of food or women for food sovereignty? Okay, so what is the role of women in food sovereignty and how can gender equality support food sovereignty? I'll just stop here for a few minutes so that you can reflect and post some responses in the chat. Yeah, exactly. How do you see the role of women in food sovereignty? Thank you, Henry. Oh, that's a great one. So women hold knowledge of seeds, right? So this is something that is often said 
that women are the one who know how to use seeds and have that relationship to biodiversity. Any other ideas? Access to property, yeah, absolutely. A key challenge is enabling women to have access to land, um, which, is a, which is a big issue, absolutely. Anyone else? Person in charge for food at home. Yes, indeed. So women are the ones playing key roles when it comes to preparing food, cooking food, buying food. Absolutely. And they know they also have all the cooking skills, the recipes, all of that. They're in charge of the budget as well. Okay, so I'll move on. I'll share my screen again. Main person who choose the good food. Yeah, absolutely. So the, making the choices around, um, around which food to eat, which food to cook. Patients in caring. Oh, that's a really nice one. Absolutely. So women are the one playing important caring roles in the family. And I think preparing food is part of that. When most male farmers were put to jail, they are the one who sustained the community. Yeah, and in most countries, actually, there is no food provided in jail either. So women are the ones, or in hospital, they are the one bringing food to relatives as well and in keeping the community going. Well, wow, great. More responses coming before I continue. I really encourage you to participate. I think there is someone, Cosmas, would like to say something. Okay, yeah, sure. Cosmas, Go ahead. Cosmas, yeah. tadi tulis apa di chat, Cosmas? Ada tadi pemilik tanah 150 tadi apa? I think he was trying to say about the landowner, uh, something like that. And maybe in Indonesia, there are... Ya, yeah, ini... Uh, Oh, okay, this is maybe different. Sorry, man. I suggest maybe I continue and then in the discussion we can open up for everyone to participate. Yeah, okay, good idea. Okay, fantastic. But thanks for all of those who have posted their answers. This is really useful. Okay, so in the second part of my talk, I want to really address the issue of gender equality and women's rights in relation to the rights of peasants more globally. So women, uh, and especially peasant women, face an incredible number of challenges in their homes, in farming, but also in their organizations. Women and girls are the most affected by hunger and food insecurity. They are dominated by men and patriarchal structures, which prevent them from fully participating in political life and in decision-making in their own organizations. Their roles and contributions in their home and on the farm are key, but often invisible. They are discriminated against when it comes to accessing land, water, seeds, natural productive resources. They also tend to be excluded from the governance of land. Women are often discriminated as well when it comes to inheritance rights. I will come back to this in a moment. So these are just a number of uh, newspaper cuts highlighting uh, sexual harassment on farms uh, and the various dangers and difficulties facing women as agriculture workers. One area that has become increasingly acknowledged thanks to the COVID crisis is women's contributions to unpaid care and domestic work. 
And what also increased with COVID, unfortunately, is the issue of domestic violence and other forms of violence that women face on a daily basis, including violations of their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And this is something that we documented, my colleague Jessica Duncan and I, for a report that we wrote for the Women's Working Group of the Civil Society Mechanism, so the CSM of the CFS. Um, this is a report that I, I can also post in the chat. So we did a survey of how women were impacted by COVID in relation to food systems. And in light of these challenges, the text of the UNDRAP is rather disappointing. And this is really uh, what I wanted to share today. So some key demands did not find their way in the final text of the UNDRAP. The first one is women's equal rights to inherit land. The second one is the importance of using gender parity quotas to achieve gender equality. So in many countries, like enforcing quotas, for example, so that half of the parliamentarians or members of governments need to be female has really helped make progress towards gender equality. But the, the importance of such quotas is not recognized in the UNDRAP. The explicit acknowledgement of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. This is also something that is missing. And finally, non-discrimination non against peasants on the grounds of their gender identity and sexual orientation. Now we'll come back to that in a moment. So what happened? Why are these important rights not reflected in the UNDRAP? And what I'm going to share here is based on a research paper that we recently published with my colleague, Joanna Book Martignoni. So I really want to acknowledge her contribution here. And this paper tries to understand why the UNDRAP is not as progressive or feminist as it could be. So in this paper, we identify three pressure points. We call them pressure points. So three moments which kind of um, inhibited the inclusion of women's rights um, in the declaration. The first pressure point has to do with how the peasants' rights agenda developed. So as I explained at the beginning of my talk, the UNDRAP is a unique process in large part because diplomats started negotiating on the basis of a draft that was developed by peasant activists. But the draft that was used as a starting point for discussions at the UN did not fully integrate women's rights. Rather, that draft insisted on the importance of defending the family farm. And it erased differences within the farm making the women's rights agenda invisible. And this can be understandable because in the late 90s, when the draft was developed, there was a lot of attacks on the family farm. So that was the um, driving force. At the same time, this is quite surprising when we look at La Via Campesina and the extent to which peasant women have been active within the movement to address patriarchy. I don't have time here for a complete overview, but I want to mention three <laughs> issues that have received attention within the movement. The first issue is gender-based violence. The second issue is political participation. And the third issue is gender identity. So let's start with gender-based violence. In 2008, La Via Campesina launched its global campaign to stop violence against women. The campaign tries to make explicit the many forms of violence that women endure, but also their impacts on women's lives. The campaign also articulates how the violences and impacts of patriarchy are connected with those of capitalism and neoliberalism in agriculture. So the oppression of women and the oppression and destruction of nature are closely related. And this was the key message of the campaign. 
For example, agribusiness is a source of violence because it exposes women and their babies to chemicals. At the same time, capitalism at large is a system that exploits and relies on women and women's labor for, for, their, for its uh, operation. And this system is responsible for rendering women's labor invisible, for making them economically dependent on men and for limiting their possibilities for participation. The second big area in which peasant women have sought to advance change is the issue of their political participation and the leadership roles that they can play in their organization. So La Via Campesina is well known for having implemented gender quotas in its international executive bodies. So the International Coordination Committee, for example, is made of two representatives from each of the nine regions and these have to be one male and one female. The movement has also put in place specific safe spaces for women, such as the women's assemblies. So before the big conferences, the women would meet separately so that they can discuss in a safe manner their issues, their aspirations and their visions. Increasingly, such safe spaces also exist within national organizations. At the last international conference of La Via Campesina in 2018, La Via Campesina officially launched its concept of popular peasant feminism. This concept is really new and it's hard to find anything written about it, but it is an attempt to flesh out a feminism that is really grounded in the realities of rural women, because most of the writings around feminism were driven by urban women. Finally, I want to highlight that there has been efforts in the last three, four years, mostly in Europe and in North America, to address within peasant movements, systematic discrimination in the countryside towards people with diverse gender identities. These issues remain difficult to address in the movement, and one often hears the argument that one should focus on the convergence of struggles and not bring in um, other identity politics in the mix. Despite all these developments, women's rights and feminist demands were only partially reflected in the draft declaration that was adopted by La Via Campesina in 2008, and which, as I said, focused on defending the family farm. So this is the first pressure point. The second pressure point has to do with what is called agreed language. So the UNDROP is the outcome of a negotiation process. That means of compromise. To facilitate consensus, Diplomats rely on what is called agreed language when they negotiate. So what is agreed language? The term refers to existing human rights instruments or norms that states have already agreed to. So if diplomats can be convinced that what they are about to adopt is actually not new, but has already been adopted in another UN document, even if that document is 20 or 40 years old, and even if it was developed in another context, then your task as an advocate for new human rights will be much easier. And in the case of gender, the reference was the International Covenant on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, ICDAW. ICDAW is a rather old instrument, it provides a useful framework, but it didn't allow feminist activists to push for more far-reaching demands, such as the link between the exploitation of nature and the exploitation of women, gender-based violence, or women's rights uh, over their own bodies. The third pressure point has to do with the politics of the Human Rights Council. As I mentioned, Bolivia was chairing the negotiations and needed to ensure a good number of votes so that the UNDRAP would be adopted. This required some compromises, and in my opinion, 
women's rights were sacrificed. Pressure from Egypt and other states meant that the key provisions were deleted in the last round of negotiations. But not all is lost. The UNDRAP recognizes non-discrimination as a key principle in international human rights law, and feminist groups have been pushing actively for a progressive interpretation of the UNDRAP, insisting on the link between food sovereignty and feminism, and on the importance of adopting an intersectional approach to the implementation of UNDRAP, also pushing for women's rights to inherit land. This guide that you can see here on the screen, put together by Fian and La Via Campesina, is a first attempt at articulating a feminist vision for the implementation of UNDRAP. There are also many peasant organizations developing strategies at the local level. Personally, I've started a new research project looking at women's rights to communal land in four countries in Africa, where we look at obstacles that women face with regard to accessing communal land. Because in Africa, most land has still not managed under private property, but continues to be managed uh, in a communal way. And women are often excluded uh, from land management institutions. Okay, so to conclude, I would like to come back quickly to the UN Food System Summit. The summit highlighted important tensions around the future of our food systems and the future of the peasantry in particular. The summit has used a rhetoric of participation, dialogue, even human rights, to push for solutions that are in reality linked to industrial agriculture, digitalization, and corporate profits. It is trying to turn peasants into entrepreneurs or make them disappear. It is creating new multi-stakeholder platforms that enable corporations, foundations, and powerful states to decide, completely bypassing democratic and multilateral processes. In reaction, global civil society networks and academics that support them, like myself, have denounced the privatization of the UN and the corporate takeover of our food systems. They have demanded democratic and transparent decision-making processes, processes that put the rights of the people at the heart. More than ever before, it is important that we take the future of our food systems in our own hands. What food systems do we want? In these discussions, I believe that human rights, women's rights, and feminism have a key role to play, and that defining human rights is a political exercise that belongs to us all. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions and our discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give a big uh, clap for Professor Priscilla. Well, and this is very interesting, ya. Yeah. Jadi uh, Bapak Ibu, teman-teman di sini menarik sekali bagaimana hak azazi manusia dikaitkan dengan peran wanita, ya, yeah, dalam upaya agar di masa yang akan datang kita masih dapat punya uh, pangan yang cukup, ya, yeah, buat bangsa di dunia ini. So based on the, I was uh, wrong saying, I was thinking that your research was very, uh, merely about uh, what happens in UK, but uh, it was very good because we could learn, we could travel around the world to see how people in this world, you know, uh, try to, especially for women, especially for women. And as you know, in several areas in Indonesia, there are also tribes that women cannot inherit land, even though they work very hard. Yeah, in my home, uh, well, not my hometown. I'm a Batak, and where I come from, that women cannot inherit land. Yeah, but women, women work very hard for that. And also in Bali, I think 
uh, it happens also. But uh, well, let's have a discussion about this. Yeah. If I look at the chat room, I could see that uh, women <laughs> give comments. Yeah, give comments about this. I could mention Ibu Sari. I know about Ibu Sari. Yeah, Ibu Sari is a very active woman, and, and you know she thinks a lot about the, you know about children, about genders, and maybe Ibu Sari could ask question. And also uh, Tina, Mbak Tina. I don't know if it's Tina or Mbak Tina. And then also uh, Mbak Lili or Ibu Lili. And then Kurniawati, is that you, Betty? Uh, but it also and also uh, Betty. But it does not mean that a gentleman cannot uh, give argumentation and comment and support in this uh, uh, meeting, right? So, but uh, I would like to give opportunity to ladies first. Yeah, mungkin ada uh, ladies yang mau memberikan uh, comment, like to give comment or maybe question. Uh, maybe from these uh, six ladies first that I have already mentioned, maybe uh, you could say something. Yep. Uh, Bu Maria, yeah. uh, I think in this occasion it's better if we know the main perspective first. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we yeah, I think it's very talk, yeah very important we know uh, to know uh, their perspective. Yeah. Because usually it says lady first. Yeah, and... because gender is not the same with woman. Okay, yeah. Ibu Sari, uh, thank you very much for the idea. Okay, gentlemen, uh, we would like to invite you to give comment about this, yeah? How to strengthen the role of women, yeah? Uh, not in, only in Indonesia, but also in the world. Maybe if you would like, like to talk about uh, the role of women in Indonesia, that's okay. Oke, okay, Bapak-Bapak silahkan, Mas-Mas, Bapak-Bapak, eh, kami sediakan waktu untuk memberi pertanyaan atau komen ke Ibu Profesor Priscila, silahkan. Mas Henry Thomas nanti aja ya mungkin kasih komennya ya. <laughs> Oke, okay, silahkan Mas, Mbak, raise your hand and please. Banyak sekali yang bisa didiskusikan di Indonesia. Oke. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Any Ibu Priscilla uh, invite uh, men to say something. Yeah. If you say something, if you give comment, means that you support the role of women. Is that right, uh, Ibu? Ibu Priscilla, Ibu Professor Priscilla. If men say something, means that they support the role of the women, right? Yeah. I mean, I really believe that men can. Um have an important role to play it's important for women to organize and share their experiences but uh, we are all in this together so it's also important for men to reflect on what they can do yeah. so i would really like to hear um yeah men's perspectives as well yes because i think if women active means that uh, there is a support from the men yes who is this oh this is still tina okay Yeah, maybe she can maybe she can explain what she's putting in the chat. Would she like to start? Yeah. The first one is the lady, Ibu. The lady. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, silakan. Mm -hmm. Ada bapa atau mas yang mau menyatakan sesuatu? There is a, in the chat Tina. I think if she want to say something. Oh, okay. So it means that we have opportunity to lady, uh, Mas Henry? Yeah, yeah. I think we already have the material in the chat. So she said that, uh, indeed, I must say that agrarian movement, etc. So possibly she can uh, also post in our hands. Uh, I'm not sure about our question. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, she can also uh, share her thoughts in our discussion. Or maybe we could invite Mbak Tina to yeah, yeah, directly. Mbak yeah. Tina, yeah, yeah. Tolong, uh, langsung mungkin bisa. Yeah, on cam, please. Mm. Yes, silahkan Mbak Tina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I'm sorry that I cannot turn on, uh, turn on my camera because my connection is a bit poor. 
So maybe I just kind of like, well, just read <laughs> the text I already wrote. So yeah, I, this is a very interesting lecture. I found it really re refreshing because I, I also realized that agrarian movement in Indonesia is still uh, masculine, it's very male dominated. And I mean, just for example, uh, the, the, the time of meetings for, for discussing uh, you know, any topics within, within kind of like agrarian reform or et cetera, et cetera, they always choose the time when it's almost impossible for women to join. Uh, it's kind of like in the middle of the night, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and kind of like, they always kind of like say that land issues come first, you know, and don't change the topics into women's issues. Don't, don't change the priority. Let's focus on the, on the, you know, on land. And then we, we can discuss about movement later, which of course never happened because you know, we never get the land so far. So, uh, so yeah, I think woman is always being second. But I think it's also because, you know, our local values is pretty much still instilled in everyone. And I know that there are so many uh, NGOs, I NGOs out there, even Pian and La Latia Campesina that really try hard to make participation of women to be heard, but you know, it's more in the surface. Uh, I I must say that back in the grassroots, women are still put in second place, except on certain cases. For example, in Batak, because uh, Maria is from Batak, I know that in most cases uh, around Toba and around plantation, they always put women in front. I mean, women open their clothes, et cetera, et cetera, when facing with military. But when they're talking about decision-making, they're not even asking the woman what they want. So this is also being problematic. How do you view as gender involvement, woman involvement is also like really, you know, well, biased. But, you know, when I also say this as bias, I have my own bias as well. So this is kind of like, uh, kind of like a, a, how to say this? But anyway, but I read, one day I read about theory of access from Peluso that uh, describe there are seven or eight elements, I forgot, that influence our access, our power to get, to get benefit from land or from anything. And one of them is gender, well, among others. And the other are, I think, market, labor, et cetera, et cetera. So my questions to you, do you see that market approach will actually help women position in peasant movement? Because, I mean, I give example here that, you know, I heard a lot of uh, migrant workers when they come back from Saudi Arabia, they come back from other places, they use their money to buy land to become a farmer. So do you think that, I mean, you're talking about uh, capitalism, neoliberalism, et cetera, et cetera, and those views are pretty much a market approach. So do you think capitalism in certain way helps women's position? Thank you. Thank you, Mbak Tina. Uh, well, uh, it's time for you, uh, Professor Christila, to give comment uh, to Tina about this. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you, Tina, for very, very stimulating feedback and um, an exchange. Um, I wish I, I, I wish I was there with you, and we could just exchange more over tea. It would be so nice. Um, still, I thank COVID for enabling this exchange. Otherwise, maybe we would never have met. Um, I think the question you're raising is, I don't have the answer. Uh, there's tons and tons of papers in the academic literature looking at this question, you know, whether the opening of labor markets and women basically moving away from their rural areas to go work in the cities, often in factories, you know, we have tons of cases like that, women 
uh, working as domestic workers, as you say, abroad, but also moving to the capitals to work in like a garment sector or clothing factories in, in Bangladesh. We have a lot of literature looking at are women better off? Uh, does the fact that women then have their own money uh, empower them somehow? somehow? Um, I think certainly there must be cases where women are more empowered that way. Um, but I think, um, yeah, this is a really, really complex question. And it, it, actually, it is actually the question that is hard, at the heart of this research project that I'm running at the moment in Africa. Because uh, a lot of land in Africa, as I was mentioning, is still held under communal uh, ownership. And in a way, uh, with the recent wave of land grabbing and land investment moving into Africa and a lot of people coming in to buy land, my hypothesis was that as long as the land is held communally, and so all the community must give its consent to the land being sold off, this is a key way of protecting the land away from, you know, from land grabbing. So in that sense, uh, my hope was that uh, reinforcing collective rights on the land would be a way to protect it, right, from investors. Uh, and actually what I've seen uh, in a lot of food sovereignty and peasant movements in Africa is they have more and more endorsed this discourse of collective rights over land to protect it against land grabbing. The downside to that is that, of course, when you say collective rights, often it means you know, reinforcing existing patriarchal institutions and land management structures that make decisions over how to use this land. And so in, in reactivating these collective institutions, you also exclude women again, right? So I think the question that you raised is really at the heart of, of contemporary dynamics whether we can you know, create more pro protection for, for land to be kept in the hands of a community and protect this land away from urbanization, industrialization, investors coming in, but at the same time, finding a way for this community to uh, better involve women in the decisions, uh, both at family level and at community level so that there's also something in it for them. Uh, another thing we see a lot in Africa um, is, for example, women get a piece of land that is far away from the village, the soil is of bad quality, and then, and then when after they have worked for years to improve it, then it is grabbed by other men in the village, and they have to go to another plot of land that is of bad quality again. So I think it's really important, this issue of participation, and also showing to men in the community the benefits of including men, women in the decision. And that is one of the things we're trying to do with that research is creating dialogue between women and men because just activating women is just not going to create more cohesion at the community level. So we're trying to create cohesion and dialogue so that also the men can see what the benefits are of bringing women in the decisions, right? What, what they can gain as well. Um, and I think that's really important. So I'm not answering your question. I think it's an open question and I hope uh, that all of you can look into it. Um, but I, I hope that uh, there is um, solutions for women outside of, of more capitalism and more market-based uh, approaches that would be um, really nice if we can find a way in food sovereignty to advance women's rights as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, Mbak Tina, I think even though uh, Professor Priscilla did not answer your uh, question directly, but her explanation, uh, uh, I think, gives more than what you have asked. Yeah, Mbak Tina, I hope you are satisfied with that. Okay, I, I wish you were here also in Indonesia, Ibu <laughs> Priscilla. Yeah? So, uh, you know, uh, talk more about uh, what is going on in Indonesia. Yeah. Okay, well, I would like to open to another opportunity. Uh, masih, Bapak-Bapak, ada yang mau nanya? Ini ku, ada nih bap, uh, Mas atau apa? Atau uh, Ibu Lili, bebas deh siapa laki perempuan yang mau bertanya. Ini kesempatan baik. Ya. Maria. Tanya, ya silakan. Silakan Pak atau Mas Patricio, silakan langsung saja. Langsung saja, Pak, mengajukan pertanyaan. Oh, Baik, bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris? 
Silakan Pak dari Fakultas Teknik Biologi. <laughs> well, time is yours, please. Saya selalu bertanya nanti di terjemahin tolong ya. Mm -hmm. uh, siapa yang bertanggung jawab terhadap kekerasan terhadap wanita? Apakah? Siapa yang bertanggung jawab? Who is the, the responsibility? The violence on women, men or women? Because a man is the education with women too. Okay. Well, I think you, you should mention your name, even though I know your name, because people. I mean, you can know. Know. Your name is with a short one. Kianto Atmojo. Yeah, Pak Kianto. Uh, Bu Profesor Priscilla, you can say Pak Kianto. Yeah, he was asking about uh, who is responsible about this. Thank you, Pak Kianto. Who is responsible? What do you mean? We've, I'm not sure I understand. In, uh, in uh, this, is, this is the legal questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who want to define? Mungkin bisa. Pak Atmojo, maksudnya bertanggung jawab, maksudnya apa? <laughs> Monggo Pak, ditanya itu. Ya, saya, saya selalu bertanya. Siapa yang lebih bertanggung jawab terhadap terjadinya kekerasan terhadap wanita? Wanita itu sendiri atau kita para lelaki? Di rumah atau di, di rumah masyarakat? Atau di masyarakat. Oh, oke, okay, oke. Okay. So let, let me rephrase the questions. So the possibility of social fabric, how much it bears responsibility, uh, both on the lack of recognition or even uh, direct physical violations against women. How much social fabric plays a role in creating in any in any uh, in any uh, case uh, violence or discriminations against women okay. well ibu profesor priscilla pak kianto background is biology so mm -hmm. uh, he was asking about uh, who is responsible men or women yeah. in this problem yeah, because the the question is always you know uh, relate uh, be it on the family level or social level mm, okay so but in any case how much social fabric uh, plays a role in, in that context mm. well i certainly think that the household level is key and uh, as we have seen there's been a lot of campaigns for gender equality coming in from the global level translated in national context but I think uh, what happens at the household level is really um, hard to influence. And this is where, I'm um, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, this is where I think uh, having dialogues and um, for example, this organization we work with in Kenya, uh, they have a project called uh, Model Home. So they are trying to get women and men to discuss at the level of the family, right? For example, um, will men accept to establish joint titles over the land, right? So that the name of the women also appears on the land title so that if the man passes away, the women can still have um, access, right? So, so these are questions that I think um, men are not comfortable talking about at the beginning but if you start saying you know what if it was your mother what if it was your sister um you know how can you protect that person um so discussing at the level of the household i think is really important um yeah so it's it's a it's a complex question maybe others have uh, have uh, some insights into this based on the indonesian context i don't know um i mean i think we can have a, a a discussion, right? Not a, a question and answer so much. So if other people want to add elements, it would be useful. Yeah, thank you. Mungkin Pak Kianto, do you have uh, any comment, idea, or maybe uh, answer because Ibu Priscilla also invites, yeah? Uh, if you would like to give, maybe you have idea about this? 
I think women have to responsible for their violence. Saya pikir wanita harus tanggung jawab terhadap kekerasan terhadap wanita. Karena di rumah yang memimpin, who is the leader in home, is a woman. Ya. Siapa yang mendidik? Ya, pendidikan dipegang oleh wanita. Jadi wanitalah yang menentukan apakah akan terjadi terus kekerasan terhadap wanita atau tidak. Oke, okay. well, Ibu uh, Profesor Kristila, uh, Pak Tianto uh, tries to say that woman has responsibility because uh, to choose what is best for her because at home she educates the children so she responsible for that i think uh, he was trying to say that and what do you think <laughs> what do you think of that is I, I, i think women do have some power and of course they have uh, some ability to define their own future and it is true they have a role to play in raising their sons and daughters uh, I'm, I'm, I have two boys for example I try to educate them in ways that make them aware of the rights of girls and the rights of boys and uh, what they have to pay attention to I try to also make them help in the kitchen and you know with cleaning the house and all, all of that so that they can also deconstruct these gender stereotypes and division of role. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, if you're oppressed in a system, it's not okay to just put all the responsibility on you, right? So I think it's important to have state policies coming in as well. Uh, we mentioned uh, gender parity quotas. For example, this is a measure that has had a tremendous impact, right, in enabling women to have um, to rise to positions of power. I see in most universities, for example, it is still difficult for women to become professors because uh, by the time you need to do your doctorate, uh, you're, you, know, you finish your PhD, this is when you have to have kids, this is not a good time in your life. Uh, so there's a lot of obstacles to, uh, to you developing your potential. So I think it's important to have state policies supporting that as well. So I, I don't think it's enough to just say it's women's responsibility to, um, to, yeah, to solve these issues, especially if women endure violence at the home or if they're beaten up or, right? I think it's important to recognize this is a structural problem. So not a, a problem that women have to address on their own. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. But uh, I could uh, see also that I think Pak Tianto supports the the role of women also mm. what he, uh, he asked and what he mentioned i think he agrees with that mm. yeah, he agrees thank you pak Kianto, for your idea okay well we would like to invite more uh, to speak and give comment about this human rights especially uh, the role of women regarding good uh, sovereignty uh, maybe uh, Mbak Lili, Mbak Lili, are you still there? Because you wrote uh, in our uh, chat room, you want to say something, Mbak Lili, or Mbak Betty? Uh, Professor Priscilla, what do you think about land conversion? Because in Indonesia, there are lots of land conversion, you know, from agricultural, where Person, people work on that land and then it transferred to be the uh, uh, buildings or something. Do you think this is also uh, ruins the, the rule of women also? Land concessions, is that what you say? Conversion, change the agricultural. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about Change that? of agriculture. Can you explain a bit more? So this is changing agricultural land into into non-agriculture. Non-agriculture, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what do you think about this? Uh, well, I think this is a trend we see everywhere. So I live in Brussels and uh, I'm a me member of FIAN International. Uh, we also have a local section here in Brussels mm -hmm. and we are engaged in a lot of struggles around, uh, we call it the artificialization of land. So turning land into non-productive 
uses uh, around the cities, but also turning it into industrial land for factories and all of that. Um, yeah, this is, I think, a key issue um, mm -hmm. that I think needs attention. Um, I'm not sure how it connects to women's rights uh, directly. I would have to reflect on that a bit more. Uh, as Tina, I think, said, I think women are often at the forefront of defending, um, defending agricultural land. And this we see in many places. Um, we have a question yeah. for men. Maybe we can continue. From Betty. Betty, I would like to invite you to talk uh, directly. Uh, if you cannot do on camp, it's okay. But if you say it directly, so Ibu Priscilla could uh, listen to you, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm really happy that I can join this lecture. Uh, because I just noticed this from a short notice, so I'm happy to do this. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I just, sorry, something trouble with my uh, earphone. So I'm just wondering what um, you already explained, uh, there is um, there is a right for, of woman to the, to, the, to the land and et cetera. And I'm just wondering what we can do to, as, as a, individual or as a social movement to mainstreaming this issue to the policy, especially if we get the change to work with government. Thank you, I think that's all. Thank you, Bu Maria. Okay, thank you, Mba. Yes, yes. please ma'am, you can directly answer this. Is, is, your, is your question around the process or like what kind of issues should be turned into policy? I think it's the, from, a, I mean, the government, for example, Indonesian government right now, for the uh, for the sustainable palm oil issues, they want to mainstreaming the gender issues on their on their policy on the sustainable palm oil issue. So I'm just wondering what we can do to to push them mm -hmm. to to en encourage them to acknowledge this uh, this uh, this issue, the gender issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think making visible the issues and encouraging discussions around what the issues are is a first step. Uh, I think uh, supporting mechanisms for, for women's participation is really important. So I don't know, you're mentioning, uh, is it Pine Moy, like a initiative or, so if there is a way for ensuring women's participation in decision-making in these bodies, like with a quota system, I think that can really have a, yeah an important impact. Um, having women's spaces, I think also is really effective. So creating spaces for women to share their issues, um, their challenges, um, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, and then I think it's it's about um, adopting non-discrimination policies yes. and addressing discrimination wherever you see it, right? So that could be around access to resources, around uh, different things. I mean, the, the problem is uh, these gender issues, they're so present in our societies, right? As Tina was saying, it starts with the hour at which we organize a meeting where women are stuck home with the kids and preparing food to um, women feeling um, themselves that they are too shy or they're incompetent, so even uh, sometimes, even when women are encouraged to participate in a meeting, they are too shy, they're feeling stupid, they don't want to take the floor, they feel like they're not intelligent, right? So surveys show, for example, that um, at equal level of competence, right, uh, a man will tend to feel over competent and a woman will always tend to underestimate her abilities, right? This is just because we are educated in ways that make us think that the men know, know best, best, they know more. We, you know, we listen to them. We feel like we don't know enough. You know, we're always doubting. So how to, so they, these are also strategies that we can put in place, for example, in meetings, you know, like if a, a, a woman comrade speaks, then you can maybe mention her name and support her idea. You know, just do little things like that also to increase a woman's uh, voice. I think addressing the issue of violence and sexual violence is also important for, especially for agricultural workers on plantations. So there's lots of things that can be done. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Gimana Bu Betty? Aku manggilnya harusnya Bu nih. Aku manggilnya Mbak. Enggak, enggak apa-apa. Ada Marenda kita. Gimana, gimana Bu Betty? 
Yes, uh, apa uh, udah jelas maksud saya kebayang kalau kemudian uh, uh, memang menempatkan ada satu ruang-ruang khusus untuk perempuan berbicara di antara mereka sebelum kemudian dibawa keluar. Itu sih yang saya tangkap. Ya, Terima kasih Bu Maria. Oke, okay, thank you Bu Betty. Thank you Bu uh, Priscilla. Well, I think uh, I think I would like to give one question ya yeah, or maybe comment ya yeah, because uh, the time will soon be uh, Four o'clock. Ada satu orang lagi yang mau kasih komentar atau pertanyaan? Maria, may I raise a question? Yes, of course. I'm Johannes. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, silahkan Pak Tri. Oke, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you very much. I cannot turn on my video. Oh, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. To Professor uh, Priscilla, mm -hmm. I, I would like to raise A question, but I'm sorry, my question might be uh, beyond uh, the topic of this discussion, but it's concerning with the uh, discrimination against women. Yeah. What is your opinion about the discrimination uh, against women based on the religion teaching, such as uh, based on the Quran teaching, the Muslim uh, and the uh, Islam uh, religion or the Muslim uh, teaching and uh, the Bible. There are some discrimination against women. For instance, in uh, based on the Catholic teaching, uh, women cannot, uh, be, uh, cannot become a priest. And maybe in some uh, maybe cases, there are some other discrim discrimination against women based on the uh, Catholic teaching based on the Bible maybe uh, and secondly maybe uh, based on the uh, Muslims teaching there are a big number of discrimination against women but it's uh, justified based on the religion teaching and what is your opinion about the application of uh, the right of women in uh, certain countries such as in Afghanistan, uh, especially based on the uh, under the Taliban government. So uh, what is your comment about uh, the discrimination in some countries? Yeah. But uh, the discrimination justified uh, based on the religion teaching. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Pak Triana, well Ibu Profesor Priscila Pak Triana's background is international law. It's our of uh, one of our five deans. Yes. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank My you. background is international law. Yeah. Thank you Pak Tri. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome Maria. Uh, this is a very uh, complex question so thank you for for raising it. Uh, my very basic answer will be to say that most religions, unfortunately, are very patriarchal in nature. So this is a common threat across all religions, right? So if you look at Catholicism or Christianity, Islam, these are patriarchal religions. So whether you will find... Um, spaces uh, within these religions uh, to advocate for women's rights or encourage women's rights, this happens, right? But overall, I think these are um, religions that are very patriarchal in nature. And if you look at the text, you will find ways to support uh, domination of women, uh, but you can also find uh, alternative interpretations to encourage women's liberation. So I think some women within these movements have been able to also, um, yeah, empower themselves and defend um, their, their, their rights. But I'm not a specialist of the topic, so I, would, I don't wanna get into that, that issue too much. Um, but I, I would wanna say that, uh, yeah, brutalizing women or inflicting violence of women, on women is, you know, should be stopped everywhere, that is for sure. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, Pak Tri, I think you can uh, uh, get the idea of it. Yeah. Uh, well, I think now it's uh, almost uh, four o'clock. Yeah, but I think maybe we are going to close it. But we would like to thank you, Ibu Profesor Priscilla.
uh, for your valuable uh, lecture uh, information and i'm sure that uh, this uh, will encourage us to be much better especially for women in indonesia and i hope one day you will visit us at atmajaya <laughs> one day hopefully <laughs> thank you so much and for your dear all participants we would like to thank you uh, for your uh, participation and thank you for uh, participant who asked who gave comments uh, ibu tina pak kianto ibu betty and pak triana and thank you so much hopefully to see you again all uh, in another uh, webinar I would like to give this opportunity to Ibu Eti to close our meeting. Thank you very much. God bless you all. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Ma'am Maria. Uh, it's very nice to see all of you once again. And we hope you have been enjoying yourself at the virtual lecture so far. Excellencies, distinguished speaker, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we have had productive and inspiring Inspiring time together and this event about to come to the very end but I hope you found the presentations on this virtual lecture are informative and helpful as a general reminder please fulfill the exit ticket which has been shared in the chat box uh, and then now the host will help us to take the pictures of all the participants. Please turn on your camera, ladies and gentlemen. We will take uh, the, uh, the picture together. Mr. Vincent, please help to take the yeah. picture of all the participants. Okay, Ms. Etty, I will take a picture or make a screenshot. Okay, uh, for the first page for Musari, Ms. Etty, Pak uh, Henry, Miss Priscilla, and Ibu Maria. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, then the next uh, with all participants. There are, there are three pages, yeah? Okay, for the first page. Three, two, one. Okay, then the second page. Three, two, one, then the last. Okay. Please open your camera. Yes, or, or turn on your button. camera, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, I will repeat maybe yeah, for yes. last uh, from the first page. Yeah. Three, right. two, one. Okay, then the second. Okay, please open your camera. Listen on your camera, ladies and gentlemen. The host will take the picture of all of yeah. us. Because, because of the participant is close to camera. Okay, second. <coughs> Three, two, one. Okay, then last. Three, two, one. Okay. I think that's enough, Miss Sati, and I have it back the time to you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Vincent, for your help. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Priscilla. Thank you for all the participants. Now we close the virtual lecture, and I would like I, I would leave you with a verse using bahasa. Jalan-jalan pakai masker. Jangan lupa sering-sering pakai hand sanitizer. Berakhir sudah acara virtual lecture. Jaga semangat supaya tetap segar. Jadi, uh, for Busari, because uh, right now, uh, attend this virtual lecture with not so good condition. We pray that you will get better soon, ma'am. We believe that a cheerful heart is a good medicine. Jadi, why I use this uh, verse using bahasa? Jaga semangat supaya tetap segar. Because a cheerful heart is a good medicine. Busari okay. mau <laughs> Add some untuk menutup ini mungkin ada. Is there any additional note, uh, Bu Sari? No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. On behalf of our, of the committee, please forgive us for our shortcomings. Until we meet again in the next virtual lecture. God bless you all. Thank you so much once again, Priscilla, and all the participants. Yeah, all of the participants. Triana, Alternun, and.
all the my students